Coming up on 219 West, it's March, Women's History Month. Council Speaker Christine Quinn. She has made her own share of history. Does she now have her eye on a higher prize? I must ask, <laughs> will you be running to become the first female mayor of the city of New York? Also, we spoke to a butcher, barber, and firefighter who have one thing in common. They're blazing a trail for women in a man's world. And I'm ready to go. Hello, and welcome to this month's edition of 219 West, the monthly news magazine produced by the students of the CUNY Graduate School of Journalism for CUNY TV. I'm Alciona Gonzalez. And I'm Chase Rosen. We'll have those stories coming up. We will also be speaking with an expert on gender issues in the workplace. In 1987, Congress declared March as Women's History Month. Its purpose, as explained in a presidential proclamation, is to honor the extraordinary achievement of American women. In addition to Women's History Month, March 25th marks the 100th anniversary of the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory Fire. 146 garment workers, mostly women, died in the fire. This incident led to widespread reforms for workers. Tammy Cozier investigates the continuing legacy. Until 9-11, the Triangle Fire was New York's deadliest workplace disaster. The 17-minute blaze broke out in a lower Manhattan garment factory in 1911. Surfing Maltese was born 21 years after the fire, but still feels its impact today. His grandfather, Serafino, lost his wife and two daughters in the fire. He had come over first in 1906 from Sicily, and then after a year sent for his family. And his wife, then Katerina, came with her two, two sons, Paul, who was my father, and Vito, who was my uncle, and three daughters, Maria, who was four, Lucia, and Rosaria. Many immigrant women worked in the garment industry despite long hours and poor conditions. The Maltese women were no different. The Triangle Factory space was cramped and pay was low, and its owners locked the doors and blocked stairways to prevent stealing. When the fire flared, Katerina, Lucia, and Rosaria weren't able to escape. Serafino had now lost all the women in his family, including Maria, who had died on the passage from Italy to Ellis Island. He loses his youngest, his youngest daughter in 1907, and then four years later, he bids goodbye to his wife, Katerina, and the two daughters to go to work, and then never sees them again except for identifying the bodies of his two daughters, and ultimately identifying the body of his wife. Lucia, 14, and Rosaria, 18, died from smoke inhalation. Maltese's grandmother was one of seven badly charred, unidentifiable bodies buried at Brooklyn's Evergreen Cemetery. The people that were still looking for lost relatives, like my grandfather, would, would look through their belongings. And finally, he had realized he saw the ring that she had, and then uh, contacted the authorities and contacted the people at uh, Evergreen Cemetery. Katerina was reinterred at Calvary Cemetery in Queens. The other six victims remained unknown until last summer. That's when amateur genealogist Michael Hirsch discovered who they were after combing through newspaper clippings and vital records. All that remains at the site of the fire is a commemorative plaque. The building is now owned by New York University. Today, it's filled with students rather than garment workers. Lab equipment has replaced sewing machines. But just down the street is an exhibition created by Dr. Lucy Oakley, public historian Marcy Reven, and a team of NYU students marking the anniversary. It begins with a worker strike two years before the fire to demand better safety. Somewhere between 20,000 and 40,000 garment workers, mostly young women, went out on strike. The strike started in November of 1909, and it was mostly over in February. Most of the garment workers were able to settle with their shops. However, the Triangle factory was the largest and most successful, and so it had the deepest pockets, and they were able to hold out. The Triangle fire galvanized public support for unions. Unionized workers were in a better position and were more likely to be safe because they had a voice. And when the public realized that, the tide began to turn more in favor of unions. Um, so the fire had a great impact. The exhibit concludes with a call for increased worker protection. We end pointing out that workers in illegal sweatshops in New York City and all over the world are still working under conditions that are not that dissimilar to the conditions that led to the Triangle Fire. 
The Maltese family wants to make sure conditions at the Triangle factory and victims of the fire aren't forgotten. It turned out we had this original plot that my grandfather had owned, and we never knew about it. There are 37 victims of the Triangle Fire buried in Calvary Cemetery. So my family and I are donating the plot. We're going to have a monument with all 37 names of everybody buried in Calvary. Tammy Cozier for 219 West. The Triangle Garment Workers fought for workplace protections a century ago. That struggle continues today in many ways. States like Wisconsin are proposing cutbacks and the elim elimination of unions' collective bargaining rights. Joining us is Cynthia Epstein, distinguished professor at the CUNY Graduate Center, an expert on gender issues on the job. So thank you so much for being here today. Um, so can you please um, tell me about the struggles that women face in the workplace um, daily? Well, women have the problem of reconciling their home base uh, work with their uh, workplace uh, obligations. So that's an ongoing problem that women have always faced and continue to face because unlike other countries, we don't have any kind of supported childcare provisions. Uh, and um, so although some, something like 70 percent of, of uh, mothers work, uh, and many of them work even at two jobs, uh, it's very difficult for them to manage. And as a result, um, they are not able to really make the same kind of, of, of um, commitment to the workforce that men do, which often results in them having um, uh, less opportunity for promotion and for uh, getting better salaries. Can you break down to us um, the concept of the glass ceiling? Well, the glass ceiling was, is a concept uh, having to do with the fact that uh, after the Civil Rights Act of 1964, where uh, discrimination was banned essentially on the basis of race, um, uh, nationality, uh, and um, gender, uh, that um, presumably women would have an, an open <coughs> opportunity to have, be considered for the same kinds of jobs as men. Uh, so that continues to be a problem for them. And um, women continue to face a glass ceiling. What would you say are formal ways that have been instituted into society to prevent discrimination against women? Well, I think there's been a real breakdown <clears throat> in the um, actual uh, uh, barriers. For example, in the past, uh, not such a long ago past, women weren't even admitted to many of the major um, universities like Harvard and Princeton, which were male-only uh, colleges. and which were a doorway to some of the best jobs that they were. Uh, secondarily, they weren't really admitted to uh, the professional schools like medical schools and uh, law schools until the women's movement and, and the uh, work done using the Civil Rights Act uh, was activated to uh, uh, open those doors for them. So now they're able to have the kind of preparation that men have always had uh, to go into those spheres. And what would you say are um, informal ways that a woman can prepare herself, I guess, for, um, for discrimination in the workplace? Well, I guess at two levels. Uh, one, of course, is uh, uh, understanding her rights uh, and not feeling that because she's a woman uh, that somehow she doesn't have the same right to have the kinds of jobs that men have. And secondly, um, to um, insists that she get the same kind of training on the job that men get, uh, to seek out mentorship, uh, to become technically expert in the various um, kinds of work that's typical for her workplace, uh, and for um, uh, having the opportunity to uh, collaborate with other women to, as, as a group to uh, press for their rights, because it's very hard for individuals to often uh, act independently, uh, but, but when women get banned together, you, you talked about the triangle uh, work, workers before, and of course the, those women way back in our past uh, had been very active in trying to establish a union. And can you tell us, in this current economic downturn, are women struggling more than men in the workplace? I think that uh, many of them are. 
uh, women are uh, disproportionately part-time workers, for example, and therefore they're more vulnerable to being laid off. Uh, they're also also working uh, in the kinds of jobs uh, which are used to be protected by public sector unions, and those unions are now under attack in many states. Uh, and I think this is a, a very uh, uh, problematic situation for them. So that, uh, in that sense, women are really uh, facing problems that men don't. And of course, when they do, it, it affects the whole family. So just to say this is a woman's problem is really not to address the seriousness of the kinds of problems that women face in the workforce. Well, thank you so much for coming here today and shedding light on that issue. Well, thanks for inviting me, and I'm glad that you're addressing this important issue. Thank you. We heard about women in the corporate and professional worlds breaking the glass ceiling. Some women face different obstacles, customs, traditions, and stereotypes. 219 West found three women defying the norm in the workplace. My name is Regina Wilson, and we are currently at Engine 219 and Ladder 105 in Park Slope, Brooklyn. I've been a member of the FDNY for 12 years. Um, one minute, can we turn the radio down a little bit? <laughs> a little bit. A little bit. I didn't say turn it all the way down. I said a little bit. <laughs> I used to work in corporate America. I used to wear suits and high heels and, you know, starting sores and breaking doors was not in my agenda or in my future. What persuaded me more and got me to thinking and helped me to move along to make the decisions were the fact that there weren't a lot of women on the job and I was able to make a difference and there weren't a lot of African Americans on the job. So uh, those are some of the things that intrigued me. Most of the time, everyone is very encouraging and very receptive to the fact that I'm here. But you'll also have people where I'm in my full bunker gear and I'm standing right next to my guys, and then they'll ask me, well, do you really run into buildings? Or do you really, you know, are you a real firefighter? And I'm looking just like everyone else, but the concept of, of a woman actually doing this job, it just doesn't click for some people. How many firefighters are there in the There's uh, close to 12,000. I think it's maybe about 11,500. There are currently 31 women that are active um, in the fire department, and we're not a percentage. So this is the first time I have to just deal with, with uh, I'll be an outnumbered gender wise. It's just the dynamics are different, the mannerisms are different. <laughs> That mess out of here. <laughs> you need to go. Please open the doors. Let him go. Yeah. Goodbye. You too, Murph. Take your act on the road. Tell about the birthday party. You know, tell about no. It's like, you know, your annoying brothers that you come dressed differently. They want to know where you're going, who you're going with, who's that, who's waiting for you in the car. Oh, but. They're just, I want them I, I'm not even going to no, say inquisitive, bye. they're nosy. Yeah, So, <laughs> inquisitive is a good word. They're just nosy. Some guys would think that just because, you know, you're taking this job, you might, you know, be a lesbian, and I'm very girly. Um, I love jewelry, costume jewelry. I love to get my hair done. I don't think I can ever be one of the dudes because it's, it's evident every day that I'm a woman. I think it becomes easier to work with me because we work around each other all the time. I think because of the nature of our job and because our job is so dangerous and things could change at a drop of a dime, that's why the closeness is there. Women, we are emotional creatures. We have the ability to be a lot more sensitive to things than I, I think most guys are. So I know when I was going through probate school, I cried a lot. You know, I questioned whether or not I really wanted this job because it was something that was not the norm for me. I had to break through a lot of some of the uncomfortable feelings that I had about doing manual labor to the 10th degree. So I had to develop my mind being strong and to push myself and I, at this, after finished probate school, I realized that there's nothing no one can tell me that I can't do anymore. And I'm ready to go. My gender does not tell what my ability is. 
My ability is what I make it to be. So if I'm going to be weak, it's because I'm weak in my mind. But if I want to be strong, my mind has to be strong. It's, it's the second oldest um, profession in history. I mean, it's been around forever. So this is just um, taking off the long hairs before we shave them. Being able to do it traditionally and know how to use an open razor, I think is such a special, um, special trade that not everybody can do and really master. God, I've been interested in it for almost forever. Um, this is my dad's barbershop, Paul Malay. So um, he's owned it since I've been alive. So I basically grew up with my dad being a barber. The biggest challenge for women in barbering, um, probably, you know, just time management. You have to be here before the average guy goes to work. You have to stay later so they can get their hair cut when they're out of work. You work weekends. So it's very challenging because, like, a woman usually does all the cleaning, you know, not to be stereotypically, but, you know, like, you have to go home and cook afterwards and stuff like that. I think it's, um, hard to get a man in the chair for the first time, but once they realize that you're good, they're gonna keep coming back to you. I love working in a men's industry. I don't think every woman could do it. You have to be a little bit tough, um, especially working you know, with all men. They have big egos, and it's kind of hard for a woman to step in there. And also being in a men's barber shop, I mean, you know, yeah, you're gonna get hit on. I think the men react okay at first. I think um, also some men actually prefer a woman, um, especially, I mean, shaving is very intimate. We lay the guy back in the chair. You get very close to them. So not all men are comfortable with another man shaving. So I think I have a step up when it comes to that. Yeah, there's definitely some d discrimination, um, especially when you start barber school. Before you become a barber, you have to sit through hours and hours of barber school. And like, I know when I went, it was like, I was the only woman in the class at the time. And uh, you kind of walk in and they're like, oh, why aren't you becoming like a beautician or something like that? But once they could see you could do the skill and you're probably better than them anyway, they kind of get over that. Well, we came up with Shave Sexy. That was an advertising campaign that we did for King of Shaves. Shaving's always been very boring and functional when it comes to their commercials that we should sex it up a little bit. I mean, what's not sexy about, you know, a girl in lingerie giving a shave? It kind of like fulfills some guy's fantasies, like how you see like a little sexy nurse or like a little sexy cocktail waiter. Why not a sexy female barber? Next. Sarah Bigelow lives in a world of raw meat, big knives, and bloodstained aprons. She is the only female of five full-time butchers at the Meat Hook in Williamsburg. She spoke to 219 West producer Judy Lee. So Sarah, tell me a little bit about how you got into butchering. Well, um, I started actually, I took a charcuterie class uh, when I was working at a PR firm um, a few years ago, and I loved it, and I wasn't sure if I'd be excited about working with meat, but turns out. I loved it, and um, so after that, I went and looking looking for an internship, and finally found one uh, at a store in Brooklyn, Marlowe and Daughters, and started from there. And what attracted you to to raw meat and, and sharp knives? Well, I I've always been interested in food, and I wasn't sure exactly where I wanted to go with that. I didn't want to go to culinary school. I knew that, um, but I did want to work with with food in some capacity. And meat seemed like a really interesting and sort of accessible area because I didn't know a lot about it. Um, I was a vegetarian for a little while, like everybody is in high school, I guess. And um, it was because I didn't really know anything about meat, and it was I was kind of distrustful of the whole industry. So I sort of said off looking for more information about it, but also, um, you know, sort of a hands-on experience with it because it's something that I'm, you, I surround myself with in my everyday life anyway. You know, even I eat meat every day, all the time. Um, most, a lot of people do. Most of my friends do. Most people I'm with do. Was being um, a meat eater a big part of your family? Yes. Actually, when I was a vegetarian in high school, um, my parents laughed at me and they said, like, go for it if you want to. We're not changing the way we eat. Um, but, you know, if you want to just pick out the bacon, that's fine. And how do they feel about you being a butcher? Uh, they're actually really supportive. I was surprised. <laughs> um, my, I was expecting uh, them to have the, like, we didn't put you through college to you know, have you take a blue collar job kind of thing, but they, they've been really supportive. They wanted to know if I had health care, and once I told them health insurance was covered, they were totally fine with it, so. 
Um, was it hard finding an internship? You said that it was is kind of difficult. It was actually. It was pretty difficult finding um, somebody who was willing to take the time to teach me. Um, so I went around asking a lot of different places in the city and in Brooklyn, um, in the neighborhood where I live in Park Slope. There are a couple butcher shops, um, some older Italian butcher shops, and um, they they were not really interested in, in taking new people on. And I think they were a little skeptical of people, um, of a woman specifically, a young woman who was interested in, in working in a shop that. Uh, you know, it's a it's a profession that's really physically demanding. I wasn't very strong. I don't look very strong, um, and they they were just confused and didn't really understand it. So, what does a butcher actually do? Um, at our shop, we get whole animals. Um, you know, what, pigs, cows veal, lamb, um, we get whole animals in and so we take them down from an entire animal or a piece of, you know, a quarter of an animal um, into the steaks and cuts that, you know, you're familiar with. So how do people react whenever you say, yes, I'm a butcher? I get a lot of double takes. I get I get a lot of questions. Whenever I go to a party and, and you know, there's that inevitable question of what do you do, I say it and then I wait for a follow-up question and then I, say, I repeat it um, <laughs> and then I kind of, you know, a lot, a lot of people have actually, um, at least in Brooklyn, um, have heard of the shop so that's kind of nice. I can say, oh, I work here and they, and they understand kind of what I mean. And why are they skeptical? Is it unconventional that females are butchers? Definitely. Um, it's, a, it's a strange job actually for anyone to have at this point. There aren't a lot of butchers out there. Um, and, you know, I, I, again, I used to work in PR and so that was a job that I think most people could understand. Like, oh, you're a young woman in New York and you work in PR. Okay, great. Um, but saying, you know, even if I were a man, I think it would be a little strange and people would be curious about it. But being a young woman, especially, you know, n not looking very physically strong and um, not, you know, having rugged hands, anything. I don't have any physical tells necessarily that that's the job I do. So people are definitely a little skeptical, especially in street clothes. I, you know, I just look like anybody else. Are, are times changing to become more accepting? Definitely. Um, we have a lot of female interns. I know when you were in the shop, you saw um, a, a, at least a couple there. And so we have um, at least, I think maybe four female interns right now, um, which is great. We have another person who comes in and does a lot of our charcuterie who also does butchering, and she's fantastic. Um, and so we get, um, we're, we're actually, what I really am proud of is that we're kind of turning the tide with customers. So when the customer comes in, we, when we first opened, um, had a lot of people, a lot of men actually, asking to talk to a different butcher because they didn't want to talk to me. Uh, they didn't think I knew what I was doing. And so just giving them kind of a hard time in a, in a nice way, but you know, making sure that they knew, yes, I know what I'm talking about. Yes, I know what I'm doing. Um, and just really changing minds that way has been really fun. There are two uh, main butcher shops in, in off the Graham stop. Mm -hmm. And I went to this old Italian butcher shop. But I came in asking for you, hey, is Sarah working here? And they were like, a female butcher? What is that? Really? Yeah. Oh, that's really funny. It, it, try the meat hook. Yeah. And so is that something that you get a lot every day? Um, well, I think if I, I mean, I, I <laughs> I, I think um, people who come to the meat hook are a lot less surprised to see a woman behind the counter, definitely. We still get, on occasion, uh, guys calling me sweetie or like these older <laughs> Italian guys who come in with like big rings and drop hundreds on the counter and um, asking for, you know, big steaks. They they always kind of look askance at me, but um, I think most people, we, we have a really young, um, you know, kind of progressive leaning crowd of uh, customers. Our customers are fantastic, and what they're coming in for is sustainably raised meat, and they that ethic kind of goes along with whoever wants to do this can do this, and um, it's, it's a very like forward-thinking mindset. Well, thank you so much, Sarah, for coming in. Yeah, thank you. And we'll be right back. And coming up, City Council Speaker Christine Quinn. Every now and then you come across somebody who you're in a meeting with me and my chief of staff who's a man and they pay attention to him. Pretty sure quickly they figure out that's a mistake. New York City has never had a female mayor, but that could all change with the elections in 2013. 219 West Anais Morales spoke to the woman who can make history. Thank you, Alcione. City Council Speaker Christine Quinn holds one of the most powerful positions in New York City government. I recently spoke with her about a wide range of topics, including her controversial relationship with the St. Patrick's Day Parade. We also talked about her political future. 
So we are celebrating the 30th anniversary of Women's History Month, and you right now are the most powerful woman in New York City <laughs> politics. So what do you think about how far women have come in the political arena thus far? Well, I think, you know, women have made great strides. We have a woman speaker of the city council. We had a woman speaker of the house. Had the Democrats remained in the majority, we would still have a woman speaker of the house. We have and have had women secretaries of state and high-ranking uh, positions in different Republican and Democratic presidential administrations. So we've made great, great strides. That said, we have a lot more to do, and I think women and people should be both happy and proud, gratified, and not satisfied. We don't have a woman president of the United States. We've never had a woman mayor of uh, New York City. We've never had a woman governor of uh, the state of New York. There are still not 51 percent women in this legislative body or in most legislative bodies in New York State rates low compared to overall states in women's representation. So. We should feel great, but we should feel, still feel like there's a lot more work to do. And it's not that only women can represent women's issues in elected bodies, but the truth is having diverse voices makes for better legislation, makes for better corporations. It's just a better process. Absolutely. And then touching on the percentage of the men versus the women here in the city council, how have you been received? You know, you're a woman, you're a powerful woman, and then also you're an openly gay woman. So how have you been received? Have you faced any challenges? You know, challenges? look, every now and then you come across somebody who you're in a meeting with me and my chief of staff who's a man and they pay attention to him pretty sure quickly they figure out that's a mistake. So, you know, life is about choices and they'll make the one that they want. Right. But, you know, at, at the end of the day, the vast majority of the people I interact with are interacting with me because they want to do something. They want to pass a bill. They have an interest. They want the council to look at whatever it is. And really, the vast majority of our interactions focus on that and the needs of New Yorkers. And there's very few that end up in the category of people not being in the right place as it relates to me as a woman or as a lesbian. Touching on that also, um, you know, St. Patrick's Day is right around the corner. Will you be marching in this year's parade, or is there still controversy about you making an appearance as an openly gay woman? Unless something changes, and, and I don't have any great expectation that it will, but hope springs eternal, unless something changes, I don't think I will be marching. I do believe someday I will, and I believe that day will be sooner rather than later, but uh, I don't think, though I still hope, that that'll be this year. And last but not least, you know, the media has been speculating for some time now about you possibly running for mayor. So I must ask. <laughs> Will you be running to become the first female mayor of the city of New York? Well, uh, you know, uh, uh, folks from CUNY TV were here today at our city council meeting, and you could tell from this meeting, though it's not that different from most meetings, that being speaker is a big job and one has their handfuls. So for today, I have a great job in government. I'm thrilled to have it, and I'm going to focus on that, and we'll let 2013 be whatever it's going to be. Can anything change in the next two years by any chance? You know, it's a long time. Lots of things can change. Yeah. All right. Okay, thank great. you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Alcione, Quinn laughs off the possibility of running for mayor, but her contributors have already donated well over $3 million for her campaign should she decide to run. Thank you, Anais. We'll be right back. That's it for this month's edition of 219 West from the CUNY Graduate School of Journalism. Thank you for watching. I'm Chase Rosen. And I'm Alcione Gonzalez. We'll be back next month with more stories from the five boroughs. In the meantime, don't forget to check out our podcast on iTunes. From all of us here at 219 West, thanks for watching.